we felt on this Easter Sunday morning to focus on two characters, Mary Magdalene and Peter. Early this morning I read again the final chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, just the, the final chapter that focuses upon the resurrection story. And I tell you, it still brings me to tears. It still moves me as it did when I was a 17-year-old kid for the very first time hearing the message of Jesus and reading the stories myself. Um, Mary, Mary actually was a, a living miracle. And if you read the story of Mary, Mary Magdalene, um, she was a, a powerful witness to Jesus' healing power. Whatever was going down in her life, we don't know. We know certain things that she was an extremely wealthy woman and um, there's no husband around, so we don't know where she got her wealth from. Um, but she had some, some personal problems and, and difficulties. We don't know what it was. Uh, perhaps she was involved in some kind of occult kind of power because she was delivered of a lot of evil in her life. And as a result of that, she followed Jesus. She became a really strong disciple, a follower of him. And more than that, she bankrolled his ministry. She and about three or four other wealthy women for three and a half years supported Jesus' ministry as he traveled up and down Palestine. And uh, you can read that in Luke chapter 8. And uh, so there must have been around 20 to 25 people on the team that Jesus had as he was moving. So you think of food, lodging, um, you know, clothes and all that kind of stuff. So um, we know that from her and she seemed to have been someone who just didn't deviate from following Jesus, sort of a true follower. Peter, <laughs> on the other hand, was genuine in his heart, but gee, he was so flawed and he's all over the shop emotionally and relationship wise and and is he in or is he out is he going to behave as a christ follower or is he going to going to follow the inner leanings of his dark side and lean into the devil's power rather than than jesus power so they're, they're two contrary characters but mary as we see she came to the tomb even though jesus had told her and all of his followers that he had to die on a cross. That even though he didn't really want to go through with it in the natural, and he even prayed if it was possible for God the Father to take this from him, yet he submitted his will and said, no, not my will, but yours be done. Because as the eternal son of God, he came with a mission. And the mission was to walk this earth among us, to be fully human and fully divine. I don't understand that. I just accept it. He was fully God and yet he was fully human. And uh, he walked among us. He talked with us. He interacted with us. And we have four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as you read those accounts, as he, a real God in human form, talking and interacting with people and sharing with them, and you see his responses. I, I was convinced as a 17 year I thought, you know what? Nobody could make up this story. I, I read a lot of biographies. <laughs> You can't just make up a story like this. And more than that, half the story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, has to do with the final week of his life. So half the chapters have to do with the final week. So not only are the writers saying, this is God in human form, look into his eyes, hear what he's saying, reflect on him. This is God among us. Away with your crazy speculations of what God is like, that God is angry, that God is a condemner, that God, you've got to fear him. This is a happy God. This is a good God. This is a God that loves people, that doesn't want to condemn them and, and consign them to hell. His whole heart is to save them and, and to get them to go to heaven. And the only way was that somebody had to take the sin of the world upon the, the, their own shoulders. And only God himself could die in our place. And so we see what God is like, but more than that, we focus on the purpose of why Jesus came, and it was to die upon a cross for you and for me, for all the sins that we'd committed. And so he shared about this, but then he said to them, and probably in the final nine months, so he's ministering, he's discipling, he's got his disciples 
the, the 12 and Mary and others, and probably for about two years, two and a half years, he's, he's discipling them, he's teaching them. The final nine months, he starts sharing with them, you know, guys, I'm going to die. And they say, oh, don't, don't talk about that. Because in their minds, they thought the end of the Roman Empire, the kingdom of God is going to come to pass and, and, and victory and Israel is going to reach its, its full zenith that ultimately the Messiah, the Christ has come. And they viewed it in political terms. They viewed it in the natural. And Jesus is trying to say, look, my kingdom is a kingdom of love. I want to conquer people's hearts because they see God's love in action on a cross. And so he explained to them that he had to die. But then he said, but I'm going to rise again. And they didn't hear that. And so sometimes they would say, be quiet, Jesus. Don't, don't, don't say that. Don't talk like that. We can't imagine life without you. They were so focused on the here and now. So he dies on a cross and none of them expected him to rise from the dead. Not one of them even though he told them. And so when Mary comes, as a wealthy woman, she had lots of spices. And the whole aim was to embalm his body. They started embalming his body after he died. And what they did, they would put linen strips all over, mummified, just like Egyptian mummies, kind of. And then they'd plaster the body and put another layer so that the body would be preserved. So she came with really expensive ointments that were gluey, sticky. And so they would plaster his body, put more linen on, on him, and so she's expecting to see a dead body. She's not expecting that he's risen from the dead. And so when she goes to the empty tomb, she's like, she's, she's, she just falls over. She says, what have they done? And so Jesus appears and she's so not expecting him that she doesn't even recognize him. She had to be convinced against her will. And when Jesus said, hey, Mary, it's me. Well, she flips and, and realizes, wow. And so, Mary is the first person to actually see Jesus alive. Interesting. A woman, not a man, in a terribly patriarchal society where women were oppressed and kids had no rights, women and kids had no rights, both in, 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 in many respects in, the, in that Jewish culture there and then and also in the Roman culture and the Greek culture if you know anything about ancient history I mean women and girls were at the control of, of men totally and so it's interesting that Jesus who elevated women and elevated kids and gave them dignity he chose a woman to be the first one that he revealed himself to and more than that he commissioned her to go and proclaim the gospel and she's the first that said is risen. I have seen the Lord. And I love that little statement in, um, um, where is it? In John. Let's put it up there, guys. The scripture. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen Jesus. And of course, they didn't believe it. You know, they're kind of thinking, in fact, when the other women started talking about it, just shows you their prejudice. They go, ah, women, emotional women, like, you know, like, what's the matter with these girls, you know, like. So they had to go to see themselves what was going on. And it says, Peter and John were running towards the tomb. Peter and John looked into the tomb. They weren't expecting him to rise from the dead. What convinced Peter was that he saw the linen strips. And he's like going, what? The, the, the linen strips that, that controlled, that, that were bound his head were actually folded up and put in a nice pile. Because if somebody came to steal the body and defeat the Roman soldiers, the guard that were there, and beat them up and like, as if you're going to do that. SAS troops, you know, fully armed. You're going to knock them out and, and steal the body. You're not going to take time, which would have taken probably a good hour and a half to, to get, that, get the linen strips off. And they were piled up nicely and Peter freaked out and it says he looked and he believed. He realized what Jesus had said to him, the word, God's word through Jesus, that he would rise again. Finally it clicked. And even before he saw the resurrected Christ, he believed. Because of the scripture 
and the promise that came through Jesus that he would rise again. And so Mary is the first, and then the others. Hey, I've become convinced against my will over a six-month period. I can honestly say to you, as a 17-year-old kid, a wild Greek boy of the late 60s, early 70s, I was not interested in God. I was interested in just having a, a good time, the party animal. Smoking cigarettes since I was 11 years of age, taking marijuana from when I was about 14, chasing girls from I don't know when, getting drunk, and, and it, was just, it was just the wild lifestyle. And to tell you the truth, I enjoyed my sin. Can you believe that? I was happy in myself. And then wagging school, you know, not going to school and playing sport and, and disobeying my parents who are beautiful people. And so when I heard the message of Jesus through a friend, a friend came to school and I looked at him as he was, amazing, as he was walking towards me, I looked at him and I thought, you look different. He looked different. And I didn't know what was happening, but he had received Christ as his saviour at, at, at a youth camp and he got filled with God's spirit. And what I saw was like a glow on his face. It wasn't like he was, there was a light on him. It's just something had changed on the inside and I could see it on his face. And I said, hey, where you been? What's up with you? You look a bit different today. I just said that to him. And he explained to me, he goes, oh, Bill, something's happened. And I said, what? Tell me. I'm his best friend. We, we've been in primary school together and high school together for 12 years. We've known each other. I said, what have you? He goes, I've come to know God. I know God. I went, what are you talking about? And he goes, I've, I've, I've met Jesus. I've got a personal relationship. I said, Jesus is dead. Like, what are you talking about? And he tried to explain it to me. And I'm thinking, what the heck is going on with my fellow lover of sin? <laughs> and he has to remember him saying to me, I can't explain it. He goes, you've got to come and see. Come and see what? Come. And that's when I started coming to a church like this. I started attending the week after Easter. And you know what? I haven't stopped attending for 40, nearly 48 years. But it took me five months to be convinced against my will because I didn't want to believe. It was inconvenient to believe. It would mean giving up my sins. It would mean displacing self from the throne of my life and putting Christ on, on the throne of my life and myself being crucified with him to be a genuine follower of his. And I didn't want to do that. So for something like five months, I'm battling and I'm fighting it. And at the end, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to stop coming to church. It's just my, they're doing my head in. Well, they're doing my head in. I'm going to stop going to church. I'm just going to... And I stayed home for two months and I just read my Gideon's Bible. I had a little Gideon's Bible that was given to me in, in first year high school, collecting dust. And... Uh, so I just started, I must have read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and the book of Acts probably, not so much the letters. I must have read it about 10, 12 times in that time. Just couldn't stop reading, reading it, reading it, reading it, reading it. And, and then I grabbed the, you know, I think it was the good news for modern man. I'll read it in a different trans. I just kept, could not stop reading it. Well, I still remember on a Thursday night, I saw the Lord. Just like Mary, she saw him physically I didn't see him physically, but I saw him with the eyes of my heart. All of a sudden, I just knew that he was real, that he was alive, and that something was happening on my, in my heart. And I still remember just yelling out, yes, I believe. Yeah, I believe it all. God, it's true. <laughs> I can't explain Jesus any other way. Either he's the biggest liar in the world or he's the craziest man that's ever lived. Oh, he is truly the Lord of life, the saviour of the world. And, and I just believe. I didn't close my eyes. I said, yeah, I believe. Then I couldn't wait for that Sunday night service as uh, my pastor was preaching. I didn't hear a word that he said. I just said, hurry up, finish so I can put my hand up and come out the front. And I just ran out the front. <laughs> and he looked at me like, and he knew something was different. I saw the Lord. You can see Jesus. You can't, in fact, become a Christian unless you have a personal revelation through God's Spirit 
as you, as you read God's word of the risen Christ. And then when you see him crucified for you, dying in your place, rising again for you, in heaven praying for you. He's not twiddling his thumbs, wasting his time. He's praying for you. He's revealing his love and, and wanting to help us. When you have that personal revelation, that's when you become a Christian. You can't become a Christian because you're born into a Christian family. You can't become a Christian because you, you, it's tradition. God has no grandchildren. He only has children. And they've got to be born from above, miraculously. Like they're born into the world, they've got to be born by God's powerful Holy Spirit coming and giving them new life within. Now, I was 17, and that happened to me. For you little kids that are here, let me tell you another story about Kathy, my wife. She's out the back cooking the food that you're going to eat for lunch. She saw the Lord when she was eight, eight years of age. And most of you kids are more than eight years of age. How did she see him? Well, she had a very bad experience, which I won't go into now, because there's kids here. But it was a really ugly, bad, horrible experience. And so the little girl, she goes into her, her bed, and, uh, and she's just crying, distressed at what had happened. And she actually records it in, in, in one of the books I've written, her story. And, um, and, and what she says to me, she says, I can't fully know. She goes, I saw in the corner like a light, like a bright light. And, and she, she didn't know what the heck it was, except she knew she had an overwhelming sense of God being there, and she starts weeping. She starts crying. She starts weeping. And, 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 and her mum had just happened to come in because she'd witnessed what had taken place. And, uh, and, and she'd noticed, little Kathy, what's happening? And, and she, she shared with her, the mother was smart enough to realise, because she was a believer, that the Lord had appeared to her. And it was that that little eight-year-old girl that gave her life to Christ and also she received what we call a baptism in the Holy Spirit. She received a, a gift where she could speak to God in a brand new prayer language. Eight years of age, she stopped speaking in English and she started speaking in a new prayer language that happened in the, in the book of Acts. You can read that, that when people received the baptism of the Spirit, receiving Christ as your Saviour, the Holy Spirit comes in. But then there's another experience where you can be baptised in the Spirit and receive a new supernatural prayer language where you don't know what to pray and how to pray and He enables you to pray almost perfect prayers. So she received that at eight years of age. And Kathy says, as a teenager, she could have gone any which way because of the trauma that she experienced as a child. But the one thing that she knew was that Jesus appeared to her and she knew that she was loved by him, that she was adored by him, that she had value and worth, even though all the ugly words that were being sown into her by other people were saying the opposite, and that's what kept her. So kids, you can have an experience of Jesus at six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of age. How do you experience it? As you read the Bible, as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as you hear the stories... And as you read them, think about them. And as you think about them, something happens as you reflect. Is faith from within rises up and the Holy Spirit will somehow work. It's like a chemical reaction. Like you, do a, like you read the Word, it's like light that comes from the sun and it hits the green, pl the green choroplast of plants and then it turns into starch and sugar. It's sort of a catalytic reaction. Then we have starch, grass and then the animals eat the grass and we eat the animals that's how we live so we actually we actually eat on light we eat light amazing photosynthesis so as you read the bible god's word as jesus sowed the message of the old testament into his disciples that's what stirred their faith next sunday morning i'm going to share about two guys walking on a road who also didn't recognize Jesus and how they came to faith. I want to open this up a bit more, but you can as kids, as you read the Bible and as you reflect on it, the Holy Spirit will start doing something with it and you will see the Lord. You will experience Him and you can be saved and know your sins are forgiven and to know you've got a home in heaven, eternal life and no matter what troubles come your way, Jesus will always be with you.
That's, that's what I, I, I love about the story of, of, of Mary. Her skepticism was overcome. My skepticism was overcome. And I saw the Lord with the eyes of my heart. And then Peter. <laughs> I mean, he's a scallywag. I mean, we, we, on Fr Good Friday, Peter shared so well. And, and the actor who, who played Peter, he is also a scallywag. We know that. <laughs> he was a scallywag. <laughs> Hey! In 1986, he was a bricklayer on these buildings here, and he was a skinhead from Yorkshire, England. This wild boy that had come across the gospel in England, but was kind of up and down like a yo-yo, but he actually came through, and he's one of our pastors here. And you talk to Pastor Mick Hutchfield, and he will tell you his story from darkness, from the devil's power, from a terribly dysfunctional family of origin, to new life through Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ. But Peter, in the story, when you read the, the four Gospels, you just think, Jesus, why didn't you give him the sack? I mean, I would have got rid of him a long time ago. I would have thought, what the heck? You want to be a pastor? You want to be a pastor? But out of your mouth comes these horrible words, terrible pride. And, and he just, he, he nearly was crucified with Jesus next to him. He nearly was killed. Because as Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he grabs a sword and tries to chop the head off a police officer, which is a capital offence. Thankfully, Malchus, the, 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 the cop, ducked and only his ear came off. And Jesus then and there goes, I mean, I don't know how you view the story, but I don't think Jesus was in any mood to conduct a healing and evangelistic campaign. I don't think he was feeling like, wow, I'd really like to heal the sick and cast out some demons. And, and I, I just think he goes, oh, no, Peter, 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 not now. But he prayed for him because he said, your impulses are going to get you into trouble. You've got no impulse control. The wind blows this way, the devil will just sit on your shoulder and you go, yes, yes, and you do it. He was out of control. And I think Jesus then and there goes, oh, Father, we need a miracle now. I don't feel like it, but... So I think by faith, he must have just grabbed that ear, got the sawdust and dirt off it, and stuck it back on Malthus' ear. And all the cops there go, well, what just happened then? Out of the dark comes this madman with the sword. Ah, cuts the guy, and then he runs off into the darkness again. I think they must have thought, what's going on? Did we see an ear come off? There's lots of blood around the place, but the ear's back on. I think Jesus saved his life by doing that miracle, not so much out of compassion for Malchus, though he would have loved him, of course, like he loved everyone, but it was like his passion. So Peter's crazy. He's out of control. And, and then, and then he, he, he swears like a trooper. Like you think, man, are you a Christian? He swears with the best of drunken sailors. And then he curses God. He, he's so like, he cusses and curses and he just runs away. And he goes to, you know, I'm going back fishing. This is all, this is ridiculous. This is like, ah, nah, not for me. It's too hard. So the scene, and, and, and you read it in John chapter 21. We call it, the scene is the breakfast at Galilee. There's Jesus. <laughs> There's some fish here too. <laughs> and bread. <laughs> Good on you guys. Realistic, realistic drama. <laughs> and he's there cooking breakfast for him. I mean, Peter had blown it. And this speaks to me of what Jesus' heart is for you and for me. This resurrected Savior. What does he do now? He's in heaven. I can tell you from what that says in the scriptures is that he acts as our high priest. In other words, all your prayers go through him to the Father. He acts as your interceder. He, you know, he's praying for you. He's, he can pray now for you and millions of other people at the same time. He's not limited to pray for one person, minister to one person in some time and space as when he walked this earth. Now, as the ascended son of God, he never sleeps. He's always thinking, praying, reflecting. He's our high priest. He's our interceder, he's our advocate, our defense attorney. 
to the Father. And you know what's more? With all of our guilt and fear and shame and all of our sins, when we go through Jesus, they get evaporated. So God says, yeah, I like you. God the Father says, I like you, I love you. Because, because I don't see your sin, I don't see your fear, your guilt, your shame, because you're coming with humility to me through my son who died in your place to take away those things. So we're not saved from our sins because of anything that we have done. It's because of, or anything of worth, or our works and our worth. It's because of his worth, Jesus, and his work on a cross that we can be saved from our sins and have the gift of eternal life. The three great gifts that God gives, the gift of forgiveness, where it's a brand new beginning for us. The gift of eternal life, where we'll never die. We'll never die. We're going to live forever, ever and ever and ever. What hope that is. And then finally, the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us to live today. We have an eternal hope for all our tomorrows and we have daily help for our todays to be able to live as he wants us to live. This is through Jesus Christ. Now, Peter, you would think Jesus would lecture him and say, now, Pete, can we go over your life? Can we, well, particularly, can we go over the final few days of what's happened? You've been a naughty boy. I mean, what you did really hurt me. You know, what you did hurt everyone else. Yeah, he doesn't pile on guilt on Peter. He doesn't pile on shame on Peter. He doesn't feed his inner, inner inferiorities, which he had, deep inferiorities, deep sense of inadequacy, a deep sense of insignificance, a deep sense of, of insecurity. Those big four all came from when we fell from grace. And all of us, to some degree, have them. A sense of inadequacy, a sense of insignificance, a sense of insecurity. He doesn't feed that. You know what he does? He doesn't talk about his sins. He doesn't remind him of his sins. Because Peter's full of guilt and fear and shame. And Jesus, what does he do? He just loves on him. He just loves on him. So you might be like that. You might say, man, I've sinned. Pastor Bill, I've really sinned. I don't know if God will want me. Hey, he wants you. He doesn't want, you've shamed yourself. You, 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 you're punishing yourself. God's not into punishment. He's not into condemnation. He's in, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So he gives us grace. God's free, unmerited favor. It's free, but it's not cheap. It costs God the life of, the, of his precious son. Free, unmerited favor. He gives us grace. He restored Peter. He healed his heart. And he commissions him to start serving others. And interesting, what he focuses on is, is Peter, I want you to use your life for a worthy cause. And there's nothing more worthy than the second commandment. And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And he actually says, do you love these people? Feed them. Do you love these? And at the end, Peter gets distressed because three times he, he, he gets said, but Lord, you know I love you. And I think then he, then he says, okay, if you love me, you will do good to your fellow man. You will spend your life adding value into people's lives, sharing the message of life and love that I've come to, to give you. And it gives him a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. And that's what he will do with you. When you come to know him, your sins are forgiven. You have peace with God. You have the gift of eternal life. Wow, to live forever and ever and ever and ever. You'll never die. You just go to a place that's perfect without sin and pain and suffering until Christ returns and reorders the whole universe. And he gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit, power to be able to live as he wants you to live today. And so he offers us grace and mercy and forgiveness and a new beginning like with Peter and a new sense of purpose. A new sense of purpose. And this is why in John 21, 12, I love this little statement. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And he had cooked the meal. He had caught the fish or bought the fish. He had cooked it. He's come to serve them. He is the eternal son. He doesn't tell Peter off or the other disciples. They all ran away except for John. And, and then 
None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? (laughs) Because they could say, it's actually him. They knew it was the Lord. And it transformed their lives. And one of the greatest proofs that it happened was these men died for this. They died for this belief, this conviction that he has risen and that he has changed my life. People will die for what they believe is true. People won't die for what they believe is untrue. So, you know, the, the crazy Islamist terrorists who are point oh, 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 0.001 of all Muslims, like don't think all Muslims are, is, are terrorists, they're not, just a point oh, 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 0.001. They actually believe. They believe that if they kill you, there'll be seven, 70 black-eyed virgins that they can have all the pleasure they like in heaven. I mean, what a weird heaven that is. But they believe it with all their hearts and they will even die for that belief. So people don't die for what they, oh no, we know it's not true, but we're going to die anyway. No, no, people die for what they believe is true. It's what martyrs are. So these disciples all died for this. They didn't recant, they didn't say no, it didn't happen, because they'd seen the Lord. The Apostle Paul had actually said in 1 Corinthians 15 that that, that there were 500 people saw him at one time. He appeared for 40 days. And many of those people were still alive when he wrote 1 Corinthians, probably, you know, like uh, maybe 30 years after the events. A lot of those people were still alive, so people could talk with them. And there's not one writer in ancient history that says, oh, Paul's just telling us a lot of bollocks. It's just not true. He's a liar. There's not one document saying these guys are liars. They may not have believed on Jesus, but they could not accuse him of lying. The evidence was overwhelming. My friends, Jesus is alive. This is what we celebrate this Easter. And he can come alive in your heart as you respond to him today. And I want to lead you in a prayer. Kids as well, for some of you little kids that are here, maybe you've never ever really understood the message of Jesus, that he loves you, that he died for you, that he rose for you, you can experience him. Your experience as an eight-year-old, like my wife, can be as powerful as my experience as a 17-year-old or your experience as a 27-year-old. If you've never received Jesus, kids, do it today. Open your heart to him as as I lead you in a prayer. Let's stand together. Everyone stand together. No one moving out of the auditorium. Kids, you stand. We're going to sing a song in a few moments. I'm very conscious that the children that are here this morning, and we've deliberately wanted the kids to be with us at this service, not the Good Friday service, because it's pretty graphic. For you children, if, this is, if you've understood what I'm saying to you, and I'm speaking to you as your pastor, I was a child once. I was a teenager. My wife was a child. She responded at eight years of age. I responded at 17. I want you to open your hearts. If you want Jesus to become real to you on the inside, he will. If you just say, Lord, come into my life. We big people here. If you've never received him, you know, he's just a prayer away. It's like for me, I just said, I believe. The simplest prayer is help. Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. I believe. John said, more blessed are you who believe before seeing than those who have to see to believe. And when you believe and put your trust in him, who is so trustworthy, who's revealed himself, your eyes will be opened. Your heart will be touched. You'll experience what it means to be forgiven of all your sins. Just give him your life and say, Lord, give me a new beginning a new start. I need your help. And we all need Jesus' help. I don't know how people live life without Jesus' help. I don't know how society can function, how people can can stay married and and, and have normal family relationships and, and, and function effectively without God's help. It's such a broken world that we live in. You need Jesus. I need him. Can we close our eyes? Kids as well. Just close your eyes. And I want you to picture Jesus. Big kids as well, just picture Jesus on a cross dying for you. 
He says, Father, forgive them. And he forgives you when you come to God the Father through believing in his son and humbling yourself before the cross. Kids, Jesus died for you. All your many sins, all your mistakes, all your acts of disobedience can be forgiven and will be forgiven. He speaks to you today through the Holy Spirit. And many of you are sensing this, that the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of your heart and he's saying, please open. He was not going to break the door of your life down. He just says, could you open from the inside and let me in? If you believe upon him and receive him, your life will be transformed forever. Little kids, big kids, say this prayer after me. Maybe all of us who are here who are believers, let's reaffirm our commitment to Jesus. Let's just maybe all of us audibly say this prayer. Let's just say, Dear Jesus, I come to you now and ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. You are God's son. You died on a cross for me. And more importantly, you rose again and you live. Jesus, I receive you. Come into my heart, change my life, give me a fresh start, a new beginning, peace with God, eternal life, and the gift of the Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, for revealing yourself to me, for changing my heart and my life. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.